Why, hello there, friends. It's Emma here, the bookish princess. The pumpkins are out. Fall has arrived. October has arrived. I need to get my Victober reading plans in order because I do have a couple things I'd like to read. One thing I know I'll be reading that I mentioned in my um, autumnal fall uh, Days in the Life vlog that I posted on Friday was this, The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. I'll be reading this in October with my um, subscriber book club and we'll be discussing it at the end of the month. So that should be very fun. A little bit of a Haunted Mansion vibe since I'm not going to be uh, doing the Booty Readathon again this year, but this I feel like gives me rest. Master Gracie vibes, so it should be a kind of fun uh, little Booty Readathon light. But before I get into any October reading plans, I have a big stack here of all of my September um, books to share with you. I have lots of lovely quotations. I've already been getting my um, quotation roundup blog post ready over on Substack, bookishprincess.substack.com. Make sure you go um, subscribe to my blog there if you have haven't yet, but I have so many lines from these books that I love that I was thinking, okay, this one I'll put in the blog, this one I'll put in the vlog. <laughs> so let's get into it. So we might as well start with Linnets and Valerians by Elizabeth Googe. I started reading this in August and I got about halfway through and was really enjoying it. And then I misplaced my copy of the book for a couple weeks and I was so frustrated, um, but I found it and I finished it and I have lots of lovely lines to share with you. But I do have to admit that the second half didn't quite measure up to the first half, sadly, which is surprising because Elizabeth Googe is one of my favorite authors. I think I actually would rate this one Towards the bottom of her work, if you're getting started with Elizabeth Googe, I would not actually recommend this one. I would recommend City of Bells or The Little White Horse or the Damero Shade trilogy. Um, if you love Elizabeth Googe, then you should still read this. One interesting theme that you'll often find in Elizabeth Googe is the way she deals with superstition. Generally speaking, she walks this line really well where she recognizes that, you know, belief in the occult and supernatural like, is, is not healthy or accurate, but God is greater than what what we can understand with our human minds. And there is a mystery to things and, you know, intangible things like thought and prayer have a power that we can't directly perceive the way we perceive other material things. She also recognizes that in old traditions and tales, often there's a grain of truth and, you know, something important there that we shouldn't just throw out. This book, Linnets and Valerians, is about four little children who end up going to live with their uncle who is kind of um, forbidding and very scholarly, but he has a heart of gold. Their uncle has a manservant named Ezra and Ezra is very in tune with the traditions and lore and sort of superstitions and the way he tells the children about the bees is so much fun. There are beehives in in the back garden of this you know house and Ezra tells the children that they always have to treat the bees with respect and, and Ezra himself greets the bees and bows to the bees and I love how he bids them good night. Good night all that lives and breathes in house and garden, the mice in the wainscot and the spiders round about and all that wears fur or feather in your dominion. Good night all your subjects, Madame Queens and noble bees. And the bees do appear at different points um, during the book. But I love the scene between Nan and her Uncle Ambrose. So Uncle Ambrose is talking. I trust that Ezra has not been filling your head with any of his nonsense. Ezra is a very excellent old man, but he is devoid of education and shares the superstitions of this benighted countryside. Nan fixed her clear eyes upon her uncle's face. You bow to the bees, she said. Uncle Ambrose looked at her and then suddenly threw back his head and laughed. Yes, Nan, I do. I have the greatest respect for bees. He paused and then said very seriously, and I am very deeply aware of the mystery of things. Do you think Emma Cobley could have harmed Lady Alicia and her husband? Asked Nan. Not by her spells, which are nonsense, said Uncle Ambrose, but possibly the thoughts of an unloving mind can have power to do harm if they are not confronted by a corresponding power for good. I feel like that kind of sums up the heart of Elizabeth Googe's attitude towards superstition. So generally, I think Elizabeth Googe is well grounded, but she does still like to include the superstitions and the spells in her stories. And in this one, they really are the core of the plot. And I felt like it was kind of a thin plot in any case. And yeah, I just didn't, I didn't think she quite hit the mark in this one, which is surprising because I do still love Elizabeth Googe. Um, and yeah, there were still so many lines that I loved. Uncle Ambrose is such a great character. He tells the children that they're going to be educated because Uncle Ambrose used to be a school teacher. And at first they really are not into that idea 
up. But I love the way he shows them the magic of learning. All he described they saw with their inside eyes, so that the pictures in the books were scarcely necessary, and the words that he used felt chiming, so that they remember the sequence of them as one remembers the sequence of the notes in a tune. And then he introduces some other activities since the children are different ages, so like the little one, you know, isn't necessarily going to be kept interested like the older one, but it was wonderful how Uncle Ambrose seemed to keep the three things going at once, telling stories, speaking poetry, and helping Betsy with her colored letters, as though he were a conjurer tossing three, bear, three balls in the air. When one o'clock struck from the church tower and Ezra sounded the gong, they could not realize it was dinner time already. Okay, just one last quotation. See, I marked them with my little cat, um, <laughs> cat tabs. This was towards the beginning. Behind the hedge, the sky was a bright blue. It dazzled the eyes and got inside the head and exploded there as a wild desire for wings so that one could take off and soar up into it. There was a bird up there who had done just that and his song came down to the earth he had left in a clear fall of music that was lovelier than anything the children had ever heard. And leaning against the yew hedge was a ladder that the gardener had forgotten to take away. Timothy was up it in a flash. Linnets are, of course, birds, so I feel like that was very appropriate that the children want to fly over the garden wall. Um, but yes, not the perfect Elizabeth Googe, but definitely an enjoyable one. Another children's book I read this month was The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. This is, of course, from the classic Chronicles of Narnia. I know I've seen the movie. I couldn't remember, actually, if I'd read the book or not. But as I was picking this up, when I got to the beaver's house, I realized I had definitely read the book because I totally remembered that. It came right back to my mind. The coziness of the meal that they have with the beavers in, like, the little dam, and it's just so wonderful. I love how in this book there is, like, depth and meaning and, like, a lot of Christian symbolism that's so beautiful and so many lovely lines, like that famous one, all names will soon be returned to their proper owners. There's just a lot of meaning, but then there's also a lot of coziness, like, unexpectedly, like, there's like a, a, a boiling hot pot of tea that is just really um, fun. It's a great combination of like whimsy and coziness with beauty, um, like the descriptions of the animals too. I loved this one. The courtyard was now a blaze of colors, glossy chestnut sides of centaurs, indigo horns of unicorns, dazzling plumage of birds, ready brown of foxes, dogs and satyrs, yellow stockings and crimson hoods of dwarves, and the birch girls in silver, and the beech girls in fresh transparent green, and the larch girls in green so bright that it was almost yellow. I I loved how um, he kind of personifies the, the trees there. But yes, this is very fun. This is our book club pick, so it should be really fun to discuss. I actually, when I first went to the library to get this, was very much in a quandary because at first I thought, well, I'll read them in chronological order. Like The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It has number two right there on the side. So I got at the library, The Magician's Nephew, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and The Horse and His Boy. And initially I started reading The Magician's Nephew and I got like a chapter or two in. But then I saw online that apparently there's a big debate of whether you should read it in chronological order of like the order the stories actually take place within like the world of Narnia, or if you should read it in publication order. If you guys have opinions on this, I would be very interested to hear. It seems like publication order is the general consensus of readers, but Harper Collins obviously went with um, chronological order because that's how they're numbered. So, so I think that I might end up just reading them completely out of order. <laughs> because um, now that I finished The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, I think I might go back and finish The Magician's Nephew since I already started that. But yeah, I would like to read the rest of the series because I have not read the full series. We might as well stick with the children's books, although I'm getting far enough along in my reread of The Little House on the Prairie series that this is more young adult maybe, Little Town on the Prairie, because in the book Laura is 14, 15, um, and she's really growing up. You can really see that she's just noticing more, she has more maturity, she's taking on more responsibility, and it's not always fun, but she handles it with such determination and grace and unselfishness. You see this especially um, in how badly she wants to send Mary to college. She is sacrificing and saving, and like that is the main goal that Mary can get to go to college. I love how in this installment in the series we still get like the wide openness of the prairie and like life on the farm, life on the claim. Like the, I love this um, description, especially since I was growing corn in my own garden. Now the first yellow-green spears of corn were dotted like fluttering ribbon ends along the furrows of broken sod. One evening, Pa walked across the field to look at them. He came back tired and exasperated. I've got to replant more than half the cornfield, he said. Oh, Pa, why? Laura asked. Gophers. I had problems with gophers in my garden, too, although surprisingly they didn't go after the corn. It was um, the peas they ate, for sure, and the morning glories. And I don't think it was the gophers. I think it was more birds eating my sunflowers, but I also had to replant my sunflowers. But 
anyway, when I was feeling annoyed with my garden this summer and I read this, I was like, you know what? I have nothing to be annoyed about because luckily there's nothing hanging on on whether or not this corn grows. Um, so it's just very inspiring the way they do not let anything stop them. The gopher eating half the corn, they replant it. Like they, they always find a way. I don't know if you guys can see the title of this chapter, The Necessary Cat. I loved the cat in this one. It made me feel like, you know, I should bring Cymbeline to my garden to take care of the, the rogue gopher. But yes, you get the farm life um, and the prairie life, but then you also get the growing town and like the growing community and um, and school days. At first, there is not such a great um, teacher who's actually Almanzo's sister. So we met her in Farmer Boy, which is about um, Almanzo's um, childhood. In Farmer Boy, you can sympathize a little bit more with Eliza, even though she's obnoxious. But in this one, Miss Wilder, she's the teacher. She's pretty darn bad. Um, and there's this one scene, it is so memorable. Miss Wilder is being kind of nasty towards Laura and Laura's little sister, Carrie. And it's totally unfair. And poor little Carrie isn't very strong. Um, and that she happens to be like just rocking back and forth and like making a noise with the bench. And Miss Wilder, to punish her, tells her she has to keep on rocking the bench. And like this poor little girl like isn't very strong and like it's tiring her out. And of course, Laura, her older sister, I, I like how in the book she's called um, like a little horse because she's she's small but she's very sturdy and Laura finally gets fed up and, and she finally stands up and is like I'll help my sister rock that bench and Miss Wilder is like okay and then Laura sits down and she rocks that bench and thumps it on the ground and oh I just found that scene to be so satisfying. However, as satisfying as that scene is, it does not lead to peace. It leads to more problems in the school and Laura really does learn her lesson. I love how Pa helps to kind of lead her to greater understanding because he doesn't excuse Miss Wilder at all, but he basically says, why do you think the teacher was acting that way? Is there anything you could have done that provoked her? And Laura kind of casts her mind back and realizes that she did say something to another character Nellie and she she and Nellie have an antagonism and like she wanted to make Nellie mad and she did make Nellie mad and then that just led to more antagonism and Pat points out well look you knew you weren't acting right then and look it kind of snowballed and led led you to this Laura maybe you have learned a lesson that is worthwhile just remember this a dog that will fetch a bone will carry a bone I just think that's so great because so often there are those arguments that you just want to get back at the person they want you to rock that bench you want to rock that bench but it doesn't lead anywhere good. And if you're like throwing a bone for them to fetch, they're gonna carry that bone and they're gonna stay mad at you. So it is better to speak the truth, but try to keep the peace. There are so many little aphorisms and sayings like that, a dog that will fetch a bone will carry a bone, that clearly you can tell Laura growing up were just, you know, they were ingrained in her mind and she remembers them and shares them here. Like there's this one where she's having a lot of fun with sociable activities in town, but she knows she should be spending time studying. She thought she could make up lost time by studying hard next summer, though she knew by heart the true words. Lost between sunrise and sunset, one golden hour, set with 60 diamond minutes, no reward is offered for it is gone. I have actually been trying to keep that one in mind because I feel like, especially with the internet, like there are so many ways to waste your time and it's good to remember that, that each hour has 60 diamond minutes and you don't want to lose them. There was another poem that um, Carrie actually read at the school exhibition that is so lovely. And like you can tell that the memory of it stuck in Laura's mind because then here, here she's sharing it with us. Chisel in hand stood a sculptor boy with his marble block before him, and his face lit up with a smile of joy as an angel dream passed o'er him. He carved that dream on the yielding stone with many a sharp incision. In heaven's own light the sculptor shone, he had caught that angel vision. Sculpt Sculptors of life are we as we stand, with our lives uncarved before us, waiting the hour when at God's command our life dream passes o'er us. Let us carve it then on the yielding stone with many a sharp incision. Its heavenly beauty shall be our own, our lives, that angel vision. I think that's beautiful. I love the way the faith of the characters is so matter of fact, but it runs so deep and it's coupled so beautifully with like a recognition of, I have to stand up and put my shoulders back and, you know, put in the work and put in the time, but God is also there working for me and working alongside me. I could go on and on about this book, um, but I feel like I have other books to share, so we should move on. But I'm thinking of doing like a little wrap up of the whole series once I finish my reread. I still have These Happy Golden Years, which is delightful. Um, and then I'll probably read the first four years. I, I have read that a, a while ago, but 
But yeah, I think Little Town on the Prairie and these uh, Happy Golden Years are probably the ones I've reread the most because they're just the most delicious and charming. Speaking of cats, since there was a great kitten in Little House on the Prairie, I did get Beverly Nichols' Cats XYZ. You may recall earlier in the year I talked about cats ABC. Beverly Nichols wrote these charming gardening books, um, but when I found on Thrift Books that he also wrote books about cats, I was like, okay, we need to check this out. If you love cats, um, you will definitely love these books. Cats ABC was wonderful, and it has Beverly Nichols' great sense of humor. He has almost a sort of Woodhouseian um, style about him with this just like dry wit and Cats XYZ has the same deep love of cats, great sense of humor. I love the illustrations. I'm not actually all that far into Cats XYZ so far, but I love how it begins. Oh, look, there he was with his cat. I feel like this is the perfect time to read this though, because in this one, um, hold on, where is it? We're almost to the letter A. A is for autumn. I don't know if you can see the beautiful, the just lovely autumnal sketches and their autumnal descriptions to match them. Without any great effort on our part, the stage of this little review seems to have set itself, the high-walled garden adrift with falling leaves, and two of the main characters have introduced themselves. Four, the eldest of our feline trio, and, Gast and Gaskin, the factorum and friend of many years. Gaskin is like Beverly Nichols's Jeeves, um, but he takes care of both Beverly Nichols and the cats. <laughs> and you get like these beautiful scenes of his beautiful cottage. Cats, like many other animals, need a landscape that is hushed, a landscape in which they can hear all the thrilling natural sounds of challenge and alarm. The the challenge of the woodpecker tapping on the walnut tree, the alarm that comes when the wind rattles the door of the tool shed as though one of the hated dustmen had knocked it with his elbow. And our landscape is indeed hushed, for beyond the great house the woods begin, my favorite kind of woods, all silver birch and bracken. And beyond the woods are the wide rolling expanses of Richmond Park, with the wild deer playing. A man may well lose himself in Richmond Park, as I know from tiresome experience. And beyond the park, admittedly, lies London. But I have always felt that it is really a very long way off, in a completely different world, but it lacks all substance. If you stand on one of the little hills of the park, you can see London in the distance, but it looks as though it were the back cloth to a child's theater, all tinsel and cardboard, and you can cook, and you can cock a snook at it. <laughs> You need not be frightened by it, as sane men must be frightened by all cities. Anybody who can look at the Empire State Building without a feeling of alarm and despair must be, ipso facto, nuts. <laughs> Here in the park you are safe, with your feet on the sweet soft turf and the wild deer grazing and the venerable oaks lifting their arms in perpetual prayer to an untainted sky. Really looking forward to this and feeling that it is getting me in the exact right literary mood for my own writing project because I am working on the book of Cymbeline the Third, um, which I'm hoping to have out by November. Actually, I think I'm going to put a reference to Beverly Nichols in, in the book of Cymbeline. He just deserves it. And actually, he references another cat book in, in this one, which I need. I still need to look up. I think I wrote it down somewhere. And then I know we have October coming up, but in September there were two readathons that I wanted to take part in, and I kind of sort of did. I wish I'd planned ahead better and come up with a better TBR, but you know, there's always next year because um, September was Shakes Timber and Tudor Timber. So I thought, oh, it'd be fun to spend some time in the medieval period. But of course, now I need to jump forward into the Victorian period, and I'm only just getting into the medieval period. So for Tudor Timber, I got this Mary Queen of Scots biography. I am not that far into it. Um, I did get through the first couple chapters though, and it's really intriguing. I definitely want to finish it. Um, should I, I don't know if I should put it on hold and pick it up again in like nonfiction November, or if I should just uh, soldier on now. But it's really interesting to learn what was going on in Scotland at this time, who Mary's parents were. I do like so far Antonia Fraser's writing. I like this sentence where she's describing the marriage of Mary, Queen of Scots' mother, who interestingly, this Mary of, of Guise or Guise in France, um, who married James of Scotland and was the mother of this Mary, the rival of Elizabeth. That same woman, Mary of Guise, King Henry VIII also asked to marry her and the King of France decided um, she should marry uh, James instead. So I just thought that was really interesting. But she describes the wedding festivals, there was jousting. Then the biographer remarks, these arrangements, like the steps of a formal dance, convey little of the feelings of the people concerned. But clearly Queen Mary, a woman of innate tact, was at pains to please her husband by praising his country. Fife, for example, she admired extravagantly and confided to James that although she had been warned in France that she would find Scotland a barbarous country, 
country, just destitute of comforts. Ever since her arrival, she had found the exact reverse. Fife is really beautiful. I remember seeing it um, when I visited Edinburgh. Yeah, 40 days were spent at St. Andrews in merriment games, jousting, archery, hunting, hawking, dancing, and minstrel playing. Sounds just like the Renaissance Fair I just went to with my cousin Becky. So yes, made a small, small start on Tudor Timber, and I did um, finish my reread of Romeo and Juliet by William Shakespeare. There was a fun um, Shakespeare Timber like tag video, which I just ran out of time to do, but one of the questions was, what are your earliest memories of Shakespeare? Like, how were you first introduced? Um, and Romeo and Juliet, I remember we read freshman year of high school and it was the very first book on the like you know honors English syllabus and they told you about it before so like the summer before freshman year like I think I was maybe already reading it or looking forward to it and it was just exciting with like all of these new classes starting starting high school and like Romeo and Juliet was like the first classic book we were gonna read I did do a little substack post with some of my favorite quotations but I just thought I'd read one brief one here I loved Friar Lawrence he was like the only character I could take seriously at all the rest of them, I mean, well, it's Romeo and Juliet. I love how like five minutes before Romeo is head over heels in love with Juliet, he's head over heels in love with some other girl who had the sense to reject him. <laughs> Here is Father Lawrence trying to talk a little bit of sense into Romeo when he's despairing. Why railest thou on thy birth, the heaven and earth, since birth and heaven and earth all three do meet in thee at once, which thou at once wouldst lose? Fie, fie, thou shamest thy shape, thy love, thy wit, which, like a usurer, aboundest in all, and usest none in that true use indeed, which should bedeck thy shape, thy love, thy wit. Thy noble shape is but a form of wax, digressing from the valor of a man. Thy dear love sworn but hollow perjury, killing that love which thou hast vowed to cherish. Thy wit, that ornament to shape and love, misshapen in the conduct of the both, like power in a skillless soldier's flask, is set afire by thine own ignorance, and thou dismembered with thine own defense. It was really fun to revisit that play, though. It had been a long, long time, and Shakespeare's language is just, the flow of it is so beautiful. It's like a dance. It just carries you away. Okay, I have a couple more things. Some um, e-books that I was reading. Kate Howe very strongly recommended a book called Christie by Katherine Marshall, um, which I did read and I joined Kate Howe's um, uh, book club uh, call for it, which was really fun. There was a lot to love in this book. It is set at the start of the 1900s. It follows um, a young woman, Christie, who has decided to become a school teacher in the wilds of Tennessee. The setting was particularly magical because um, I've actually been to the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee a couple times. I have videos from it, which I have just never gotten around to editing into a travel vlog. So at some point, I'm gonna to need to do that. Um, but reading Christy, her descriptions like so exactly match the beauty of the mountains. And it was so interesting to hear more about the people who lived there and their history and her efforts to you know, serve them and minister. She writes about how a lot of them were of Scottish or Irish or English descent and how you almost came across this like Elizabethan language, this sort of unexpected nobility from these people that you know other people look at them and they're like, oh, those are some backwoods hicks. It definitely takes some adjustments for Christy um, to get used to her new environment and her new community. But she does have all this useful idealism um, and sometimes needs to be taken down a peg. Christianity is also a very big theme and Christy is really, you know, wrestling with her faith and her faith is becoming real to her. And that was beautiful. There were a lot of beautiful lines that I marked. Suddenly the railroad tracks were running between the walls of a narrow valley. Here in this more protected area was a dazzling winter landscape. Everything was covered with ice, yet this was not the usual ice storm. Apparently fog floating off the higher peaks had covered everything with a gossamer coating of ice so fragile that every liniment of every object stood out from every other object, sharply defined, highlighted, underscored, frozen lace. One of the times during our trips to the Smoky Mountains, again, I need to <laughs> edit this video, but um, we went up to Klingman's Dome in the Smoky Mountains National Park. It was around Thanksgiving and it was exactly what she describes, this frozen lace, magical lace, uh, covering every single tree. Unfortunately, we didn't actually get to see the view from Klingman's Dome because of that fog. So I'd love to go back to Klingman's Dome to like really get to see the proper view. What other quotes do we have? All around me the trees stood sentinel over a solitude that stretched backward into time. Throughout my months in the cove, there had been Alice Henderson's gentle, unfailing teaching about the validity and the presentness of the inner light, and her insistence that I not take her word for this, but actively experiment with it. Perhaps the most important single secret she had taught me so far was the how of looking to this inner reality for the help I needed. First, I had to recognize evil for what it was. That meant honesty, which could be costly in day-to-day -day dealings with people. It took vigilance, too. 
Secondly, I had to declare war on that specific evil, whether it was disease or mental illness or a child who was on the wrong path or snarled human relationships or my own impatience or temper or resentment or just that I violently hated some duty which I knew perfectly well I had to perform. Third, and here was the heart of the secret that I was struggling to grasp, I had to step aside and ask someone else to do the fighting for me. And every time I thought of my particular battle, usually many times a day, I had to step consciously out of the way again and give gratitude to him for the battle he was waging on my behalf right then. Sometimes it took days, sometimes longer, for evil was rarely flimsy, but the outcome was sure. Sure because he was and is the Lord of life. And sure because evil is at the last, always a coward that slinks away when finally challenged and faced down. So there, there were lots of great passages about faith, about nature. However, I wish I could say this book fully clicked with me. I feel like it just, it didn't quite get there. It was too long. I don't think I could have even finished it if I didn't skim, like honestly, this the last third of it. It needed an editor. At one point, the character has been summoned to another character's house and like, it's a high tension situation, right? She needs to get there. But the author puts in like two pages of description of like the woods that she's walking through. And then she's like, oh, but I wasn't noticing the scenery. And it's like, well then why did you just drag us through two pages of scenery description, which you've already described that beautifully elsewhere. And in spite of the fact that there were lots of beautiful reflections about about faith and you know the characters were trying to grow and were trying to you know correct their mistakes at the same time there was just a little bit of a holier than thou attitude that like just rubbed me the wrong way like you'd have that beautiful description of faith but then like a couple pages later you'd have something that like just didn't quite click. Like it was almost like the writing was a little bit uneven. Even Miss Alice, I think we're meant to really love and respect Miss Alice. I just never really clicked with her. She felt a little bit distant, even though there were certain descriptions of her that I was like, oh, that's lovely. As a character, she just didn't come alive to me. I sympathized a little bit more with Christy, the narrator. Even her, there would be times where just her self-importance, in some cases she obviously was battling her self-importance and trying to take herself down a peg, but there were others where like, she clearly didn't even know, the author didn't even know that like she had a problem. A couple times she mentions that like here in the mountains, like her faith came alive to her in a way that it hadn't back at home. And it's like, okay, that's fine. But like the way she phrased it, there was always this sort of assumption that like, well, the faith wasn't actually real to anyone back at home. It was only real to her. Part of faith is humility and recognizing that we're all coming towards God in different ways. It's not just you and your situation that has the intelligence to open your eyes towards, you know, it's it's everyone. Yeah, so I wish, I wish I could say this book was a home run because there were so many good things about it and I am super glad I read it. But yeah, for, for whatever reason, it just didn't fully click. I have made some more progress in Anna Karenina. I'm now through book four or volume four. There are eight volumes, so I'm halfway through. To be perfectly honest, if this book was only about the title character, Anna Karenina, I think I would have given up on it by now because I just don't find her plot line interesting. I find it to be boring. It kind of goes back to what I was talking about in my Jane Austen video earlier this summer. It's like there are two ways you can approach life. Either you can throw a fog over your problems and like deceive yourself and deceive other people. And like everyone in the Anna Karenina kind of plot line, so Vronsky, Anna, and her husband, that is what they're doing. They're just like throwing fogs and not wanting to deal with the problem. And that's just not very interesting. But luckily there are some characters in the book who are trying to disperse the fogs. Maybe inadequately, maybe imperfectly, but they are trying to, you know, grapple with their disappointment. And, and looking for the truth. So Levin and Kitty are the reason I am still reading this book because I do really like their plot line and I do really like their scenes. When I got to um, the horse race, which is just clearly chock full of symbolism when Vronsky is going on the horse race. And like the way that all plays out once I read it, I was like, okay, now I know Anna's plot line. Like I don't need to read any of the rest of it. Like there it is in a nutshell. But Levin and Kitty are really fun. They're both separately. Um, Kitty is in Europe and Levin is, is in Russia. But um, they're both obviously like trying to find interest and meaning in the people around them. Think about things other than themselves. And they both are really intrigued by different people they meet who they admire. And they try to look at those people and say, well, what is it about her, her life or his life that seems to give him or her this like inner serenity? But then they take that questioning even deeper and say, okay, well, maybe there's something about them that I admire, but they're also human, so they're not perfect. Seeing the process of them growing and thinking these things through is, is really satisfying. Um, I liked this description of Levin. There's this other nobleman that he knows that like seems to have it all together, but does he really have it all together? And Levin 
almost tries to question him and like lead the conversation to deeper depths. Lamas saw that he was not to discover the connection between this man's life and his thoughts. Obviously he, the other nobleman, um, did not care in the least what his reasoning led him to. All he wanted was the process of reasoning, and he did not like it when the process of reasoning brought him into a blind alley. That was the only thing he disliked and avoided by changing the conversation to something agreeable and amusing. This dear good Shivasky, keeping a stock of ideas simply for social purposes and obviously having some other principles hidden from Levin, while the crowd, whose name is Legion, he guided public opinion by ideas he did not share. So the characters who are actually trying to, you know, disperse the fogs instead of spread them make this book worth reading. And, and Tolstoy does have, you know, really brilliant writing and these really beautiful insights that, that pierce the fog and grapple with, with opposites. I liked this quotation. Those joys were so small that they passed unnoticed, like golden and sand, and at bad moments she could see nothing but the pain, nothing but sand. But there were good moments too when she saw nothing but the joy, nothing but gold. So yeah, I still have half of Anna Karenina to go, and I feel like there's nothing more to be said about Anna's story. Like, yep, that's depressing. People are the worst, and their own sins drag them down and down deeper and deeper and deeper. But for Levant and Kitty and the other characters and the beautiful writing and description, um, I am going to get through the rest of the book. My favorite scene actually was when Levant was doing the mowing. Um, he joins the peasants on his estate to you know use the sickle and like get the field cleared and I was doing some mowing modern mowing with a mower um, at my at my house recently um, and it was supposed to rain the next day and it was getting dark but I was like oh, I'll just finish this and I was like channeling Levent and like the joy that he feels and just like the the movement and like the rhythm and just being outside and being part of this team clearing the field it's, it was just a beautiful description and um, yes now I'm going to try to keep it in mind if I'm ever annoyed by the chore of mowing okay Okay, last thing. I wanted to mention my Magnificat. I feel like I should mention it in more of my reading blogs because there are always such beautiful prayers and reflections that I read in it. Magnificat is um, the prayer app. You can also get it as a physical book. It has the mass readings and prayers and reflections for every day um, for all the feast days. There are a bunch of Marian feast days throughout the month of September, um, which put me in mind of this um, quotation from Elizabeth Googe, which I, I put in um, my Substack post recently. It's in The Valley of Song uh, by Elizabeth Googe, which I read earlier this year. She kind of weaves the astrological signs into her story as characters. And for the month of September, Virgo, the Virgin, she interprets that as the Virgin Mary and talks about like a blue September sky and how that's like Mary's blue cloak. And I just thought that was so appropriate since there are a couple Marian um, feast days this month. But just recently, um, the 29th was Saints Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael. And I absolutely loved this hymn um, that they have for the morning. In, in the Catholic Church, um, you'll often hear the St. Michael prayer. Um, but this one has all three archangels in it. And it's like, why wouldn't you include all three? Oh Lord, the angels sheer delight, their life reflects your splendor bright. As we today their praise declare, may we their joy forever share. Saint Michael, be our refuge here, preserve us from all useless fear. Through you may God his peace bestow on all the nations here below. Saint Gabriel, be with us this day, reveal God's will to us, we pray. As Mary once did answer you, may our response be firm and true. Saint Raphael, heal our sinful heart, may God his grace to us impart, and may you guide us on the way that we may never go astray. I just thought that was beautiful. My mom was recently reminding me of um, the guardian angel prayer. My grandmother had a great devotion uh, to her guardian angel, and so my mom was saying I should pray this more often to my guardian angel, and she actually made me a little prayer card, um, which is so beautiful. And the other Magnificat quotation, which this video is already getting long, so maybe I'll, I'll save it for the blog. But it was from St. John, um, it was from St. John Chrysostom, Archbishop of Constantinople in 407. And if you want to hear that one, you should pop over to the blog because it's kind of long and I, and I think I should wrap this video up. As always, I'd love to hear what you've been reading throughout the month of September. Let me know down in the comments below. Let me know about your reading plans for October. Make sure you give this video a thumbs up and make sure you're subscribed. I'll talk to you guys again soon. Until then, stay bookish. Bye.